What a thrill, sir. And I, I guess you get this all the time. I edit Fangoria now, but I wouldn't be involved in uh, this, uh, this line of work at all if it wasn't for being raised, literally raised on your book. So thank you. Well, uh, I don't get that every day of the week, and it's, it's a very kind uh, thing for you to say. It's a nice compliment. So, you know, one thing, you are still kind of shrouded in myth to me. I mean, before there was IMDb or anything, there was the Leonard Maltin book, and every year I would get the new one bought for me, and I'd highlight movies. This is how I memorized running times and whether a film was color or black and white or a TV movie. But just tell me a little bit about your history and how the movie bug first bit you. Well, I wish uh, I wish I could say it was uh, inspired by something um, uh, less mundane than this. <laughs> but what it was is that I, uh, I I started publishing my own the first version of a, my own publication when I was in the fifth grade. A friend and I had the itch to create our own sort of newspaper slash magazine. And this is so many years ago. It's before there were Xerox machines and Kinkos on every corner and, you know, any of today's technology. Uh, uh, and, uh, but, but we got the bug. And uh, at one point we inherited a uh, uh, mimeograph machine, something that uh, you may never have even seen or heard of in your life. <laughs> common, common uh, device in schools at the time and libraries for making duplication. And um, bit by, over the years, uh, as my interest in movies grew, and, and uh, particularly movie history, that's what I started writing about more and more, uh, to the point where uh, when I was 13, I read about the, this whole network of fanzines out there. Right. And I, I wrote letters to the editors of two of them, one was in Indiana, Pennsylvania, and that was called the 8mm Collector. And one was in uh, Vancouver, and that was called Film Fan Monthly. And I wrote to both of them, uh, offering my services as a writer. Uh, and they both said, sure. I sent sample articles, I think. And they both said, sure. And then I let them know I was 13 years old. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, uh, and and one of the great turning points of my life, they both said they didn't care. Wow. Uh, it turns out that the guy in Vancouver was 19. Wow. And uh, so uh, while I was still publishing my own little homegrown uh, magazine, I was writing for these two fellas. And th these were all labors of love. There was no money involved. It was just for the fun of doing it. And uh, uh, two years later, after contributing every month to Film Fan Monthly, the fellow who did publish and edit it, uh, said he didn't have time to do it anymore. Would I want to take it over? And I said, sure. He had 400 subscribers uh, all over the world, actually, mostly North America, but, but uh, Australia, New Zealand, some in Europe. And he was printed like by a professional printer. Right. Uh, no more mimeograph machine. So uh, we sort of merged our two mailing lists and... Uh, uh, I was 15 years old. I became the editor and publisher of Film Fan Monthly. And a couple years later, a teacher, I was in Teaneck, New Jersey, at Teaneck High School. And a very nice woman who was an English teacher stopped me one day and said, uh, she wasn't my English teacher, but she knew me and I knew her. And she said, you know, I love what you do. And I have a friend who's an editor at Signet Books in New York. And uh, I think the two of you would just hit it off. I want you to call him and go, go see him after school one day. So I did. And, uh, of course, this was uh, very heady, very exciting, and I didn't know what it would lead to. You know, in my head I had dreams that it <clears throat> would, you know, in some, some way lead to my writing a book for him. But who knew? Right. I went to see him, and I brought a stack of my magazines with me. And as we were breaking the ice, he said, uh, what would you bring? I said, well, this is this magazine I put out. He said, oh, he said, I love your magazine. Wow. You know what? He said, sure. He had subscribed when he was at a different publishing house. I didn't put the name together with this guy on the subscriber list. And he said, do you know this book by Stephen Shore called uh, Movies on TV? I said, of course I know it. I use it every day. And this was the only book of its kind at the time. It was published by Bantam Books. Okay. And I did use it every single day. So I knew it inside and out. 
He said, what do you think of it? I said, well, I think it's pretty good as far as it goes. He said, what would you do differently? And I said, well, I put in longer cast lists. He only lists like two people. And I put in the director's name. And I'd add uh, the running time so you know if the local TV station is cutting it or not. And whether it's in color or black and white. I just rattled all this off the top of my head, which I was able to do because I knew this book so well and and missed those things in it. Right. He said, how'd you like to do it? I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm looking for somebody to do a, to do a rival book, to compete with that book. How would you like to do it? This was the spring of 1968. I was 17 years old. Wow. And... Uh, I said, well, I guess so. And he said, uh, well, then let's do it. Uh, it was just, you know, how do you, how do you invent a story like that? It sounds like a B-movie script, but, yeah. but it, I, I guarantee you it's it's genuine. Well, you, you're so funny. I can't believe you, you, hopefully your tongue was deeply in cheek when you said that may have been a mundane story because it's anything but. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, that man is... Who, gave, who changed my life is still alive. And oh, we're, still, we're still friends. He tells he tells the story slightly differently, but then he he's he's more of an embellisher than I am. <laughs> um. You know, one thing that's funny, and because of my, again, it's stemming from your line of work, what I do, but coming of age in the, the internet age, when everything that you write is is instantly, the feedback comes right at you. And as you know, film fans are very passionate, sometimes, right. sometimes not terribly sophisticated, and they speak from the heart, and sometimes it gets ugly. Do you remember the first time you got hate mail for reviews that you have, had written? M- mail started coming fairly soon. Yeah. Uh, and even the occasional phone call. Uh, and I don't remember getting hate mail. No, I have to tell you, I think that is largely uh, a, uh, a sorry phenomenon of the Internet era. Wow. Uh, I got nut mail. It's <laughs> <laughs> a slightly different category. Yeah. Uh, I, got, I got nut mail pretty early on. <laughs> prolific letter writer. I wrote fan letters to people, and you know, and, uh, you know it was always exciting when I got an answer back. So I, 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 was, I, was, I was very conscientious about trying to answer my mail, but I, I quickly learned that uh, uh, some people, you know, uh, thought that that was an invitation to carry on pen pal correspondence. <laughs> right. I decided I would answer once. Yeah. You know, and if, and if you know, and say, you know, that was it. That was it. But uh, the good part of it was that uh, people would would catch mistakes. Right. Mistakes of omission and commission. And at first I found this very despairing. When the first edition came out, all I saw were its shortcomings. Right. That's all I could could see. Uh, And, uh, but a friend of mine said, hey, the only people who don't make mistakes are people who don't do anything. This is true. I, I tried to take that to heart. And... One of the things that's been most satisfying about having this totally unexpected long run with the book is being able to make it better every year. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I know not as a, not as a boast, but as a, a fact that it's more accurate every year. And that's largely because of our readers. Well, this is true, but this is something I wanted to bring up. As a devout reader of this book, since I was a very young child... Um, you know, to the point where people were actually worried about me. Like, why, why does, why doesn't he take up a sport? What the hell is he doing? Um, but I noticed as the years go by, obviously the amount of films being produced increases and the space that you can give these films decreases. So you're, you're forced to call the herd a little bit. And I noticed, you know, from volume to volume, that's why I keep them all is that, you know, sometimes a movie, it gets missed or it gets removed. What's your criteria for killing a movie? Well, we, we haven't killed as many as you think, and there's an asterisk that goes with this question, with this answer. Right. Um, what we did have to kill, the first thing we had to kill was made for TV movies. Right, right, yeah. And, and, and that, was, that was a shame, because we were the only people covering them. Yeah. Uh, I think at the time we were the only, you know, uh, 
source book covering them. Yeah, and it was an interesting uh, rating system you had with above average, average. Uh, mm-hmm. below, yeah, very interesting. And uh, and so that you know that, that hurt. It hurt to, to lose that, but it was a finite amount of space. Yeah, and something had to go. Uh, and then we did have to do some judicious pruning, and then finally uh, we created a spinoff book, Leonard Maltin's classic movie guide. Right we did for the first time, I guess, five years ago. Okay. And uh, the the rationale was that we would... Uh, I feel in, a, in, in, in this book of, of so many years standing, you've always got to be able to look up The Wizard of Oz. Yep. Or The Phantom of the Opera, or uh, Ben-Hur, or It's a Wonderful Life. Sure. You know, they've always got to be there. Yep. But the lesser old movies, the ones that aren't classics, just old... <laughs> Uh, have migrated to the classic movie guy. Yeah. And and now we've done a second edition of that, which has been satisfying because we were able to add. In fact, when we did the first edition of the classic movie guide, we we created 1,100 reviews for movies we've never covered before. Right. And then for the second edition, we added 300 more. So that's 1,400 vintage films, you know, that we're, we're covering for the first time. And that's a source of great satisfaction. Uh, but in the annual, it's, uh, you know, we're um, uh, being uh, an old-fashioned uh, book with uh, pages and binding and glue. There's, you know, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, between the, the, not proverbial, but literal rock on a hard place. You know, another thing I want to talk about is... Um not omissions, but revisions. Now, you know, Wizard of Oz, Ben Hur, these will always be four star films. You came into the game as four star films, and, and they will forever be known as this. But, uh, you know, in my line of work, horror films, cult films, this is sliding scale. And I always give these movies about 20 years before we can properly appreciate them. I just did a sit down with the cast of David Cronenberg's 1979 film, The Brood. And we all had a good laugh how Leonard Maltin gave it a bomb. And I think the review was something along the lines of. Uh, uh, midgets beat school teachers to death with mallets. Isn't it a lovely world we live in? Have you ever gone back and revised a review based on public opinion or cult appeal? Yes. I don't do it often, and I don't do it lightly. Uh, I don't want to be seen as um, not having the courage of my convictions. You know right. what I'm saying? Right, right. Uh, I feel that if people think that I can change too easily, that's not a good idea. Mm-hmm. But I, I uh, if I had my druthers, okay, now th- this is a silly hypothetical, but just bear with me. If I could review all 17,000 movies every year, fresh, right, and write fresh opinions, that's what I would do. Because Times change, movies change, tastes change, the world changes, and to you know to pretend otherwise is uh, is foolish. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can give you one dramatic example, which is in your uh, uh, your bailiwick, which is Alien. Yes, two stars. I think you gave it first round, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, two and a, actually two and a half. Pardon me. And then I saw the uh, 25th anniversary edition that Ridley Scott, you know, reissued theatrically and tweaked ever so slightly. Right. And uh, in those 25, well, when I first saw it, I have to tell you, I have to tell you that I'm, I'm a wimp. Uh, uh, I, I have a very hard time with the, the current generation of graphic horror films. Just because I'm just too, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm too hypersensitive. That's a, that's a redundancy. I'm hypersensitive. And um, uh, so I don't derive pleasure from watching right. most of that. Fair enough. And uh, so when I first saw Alien, it just uh, uh, it scared the hell out of me, and I found it unpleasant. Right. Not in a... You know, it wasn't a... a um, a thrill ride for me. It was it, it was a torture. <laughs> yeah. 
and that, and I responded accordingly. Now, obviously, you know, it was a well-made movie and all of that, so I didn't, you know, you know trash it, but I, but I wasn't enthusiastic, to put it mildly. <laughs> right. 25 years later, I went to see it again on a big screen, and I said, this is, this is a, a fantastic movie. What had happened in 25 years? Well, I'd seen 25 years of rip-offs <laughs> yeah. and homages. And sequels, yeah. And sequels and lesser versions by lesser by less talented people. Mm-hmm. And I guess my tolerance level had risen <laughs> for, you know, for some of the some of the more graphic material in it. Right. And I appreciated it as I hadn't appreciated it before. And uh, uh, and so I yeah, I completely redid it. Uh, uh, I have tried to uh, I actually spent spent far too much, too much of my of my life revisiting Blade Runner. <laughs> I was just going to bring up since we're on the Ridley Scott tip, right? I, and I have not changed my mind. No, it still sits at one and a half stars. Am I right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you now, now you, you say you haven't gotten any hate mail, but you must have gotten some people looking at you with scones about that. Oh, that and the brood too. Right. Oh, and and, uh, uh, and the, the brood is one I probably should revisit. Yes. Uh, uh, and there, there, there are people who I respect who encourage me to do so. But uh, uh, it's a. Um, It's not not something I set out to do consciously, right? But uh, you know, it, it's sometimes. Uh, I think your your uh, what you said to me makes makes uh, all the sense in the world. My my least favorite quote that you see sometimes in movie ads is an instant classic. <laughs> yeah, that's an oxymoron. <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, and and uh, we don't know what's a classic now. We won't know for a while. Right. And uh, uh, I. Uh, But I, but I think that it's important to constantly revisit films, and uh, and sometimes you get an unpleasant surprise, something that you cherish. You know, it doesn't hold up as well as you wanted it to. This is true. And yeah. and uh, and of course, you know, the styles and uh, and uh, fashions of filmmaking are changing so quickly. Uh, it's uh, almost discouraging how quickly. Uh, you know, there's no exposition anymore. Uh, every film seems uh, bound and determined to grab you in the first moment. You know, throw something in your face so you don't get bored. They don't even want to uh, risk boring you with main titles anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's a strange phenomenon. But yeah, you know, let's let's just let's just get into the movie. And what are you going to do? Walk out during the main titles? <laughs> I think my first real the jarring experience with that was it was an effective experience, but it was still unusual. Was Miami Vice? Mm-hmm. Remember, it just began. There was not even any uh, nothing zero. Yeah, yeah, I know there have been a handful of films that haven't even shown you the title card. Yep, uh, it, it's it's astonishing. But uh, but there we are. On the other hand, I saw uh, uh, Rear Window last year. I introduced the screening of it here in L.A. Right at the uh, Orpheum Theater, which seats about two thousand. And uh, I said I hadn't seen it on a screen in a long time, so I sat down to watch it. And there were a lot of young people there that night. It was not just you know a bunch of uh, uh, diehards. And uh, that film is the uh, plays out in in the opposite manner. Mm-hmm. It opens on a close up of Jimmy Stewart perspiring. Right. <laughs> and slowly establishes the apartment. And why he's there because of the, the the cast on his leg, what he does for a living because of the photos on the wall and the cameras everywhere. And then what happens next? Thelma Ritter shows up, this housekeeper, and 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 has a long conversation with him. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just, I mean, it, it's you know, it's almost an object lesson in how not to make a contemporary style movie. Right. But it worked, and Hitchcock reeled in that audience. Mm-hmm. You know, like a uh, like like a great fisherman would, and uh, and and caught them and held them. So you know, some films do hold up, and some films do uh, stand the test of time, in spite of the the massive changes that we've seen. 
Now, we talked about you know the brood being one of them that you maybe partially want to revisit and perhaps revise. But is there have, have there been any films that you have been overly enthusiastic about, as you say, and that maybe stick out like sore thumbs now in your book where you wish you could maybe give it a lesser star rating? Well, I think I, I think I actually... Let me before I say this out loud. Let me look at my own book. Hang sure, on a second. Sure. Hang on. Almost there. Again, you just can't revisit everything all of it. Well, yes. You referred to Ben Hur as a four-star movie. I think some years ago I reduced it by a half star. Is that right? Well, now why is that? Because I, I, while I think it's a very good movie, I, 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 I'm not sure it's a great movie. Okay. <laughs> and there's and there is a there's a there's a difference between very good and great. Yeah. That's interesting. Which is not to knock very good. You know, we live in an age of hype too, where suddenly good is not a good enough compliment. <laughs> well, it's like getting an A and wondering why you didn't get the A plus. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, this, the quote unquote mundane story you related to me about how you became what you became, um, you mentioned the unfortunate byproducts of the internet as well. How do you feel about this instant celebrity critic phenomenon that has hit us now with the internet? I love it. I think it's just great, Chris. Is the tongue still firmly wedged in your cheek, sir? Yeah. In fact, I can barely talk. Okay. <laughs> I can't, can't get it dislodged. Please speak, no, speak know, from the hip, uh, please. Yes. Um, everybody's a filmmaker, everybody's a musician, and everybody's a critic. Uh, so on the one hand, you know, theoretically, it's the, uh, one has to applaud the democratization of, of the media, right? Right. And we're supposed to applaud it. Uh, isn't this great? Everybody has access now. Mm. Uh, the gatekeepers are no longer the exclusive, uh, you know, conduits to, to an audience. Well, in theory, that's good. Uh, but not everybody has talent. Not everybody has skills. Uh, and some of the talented people maybe uh, have been barred from reaching an audience because they haven't, you know, been lucky and they haven't gotten to the right people and gotten, you know, so, so, uh, but as with any democratic process, uh, if you let one in, you let them all in. So you've got a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of idiots out there too. <laughs> on, on, on the one hand, I guess the, the only plus side to it is now, uh, being an online critic, it's much easier to revise your opinion Right? Just go on in the back end and edit it, and maybe no one will even notice. Well, yes, exactly. Exactly. I mean, you know, I, mean, uh, you know, I, I use the Internet as much as anybody. Uh, I, I enjoy having a website where I can write anything I please. Yep. Uh, no one looking over my shoulder. Uh, uh, and uh, people are free to leave, you know, feedback and uh, all of that. Uh, I love instant access to, to information. Uh, as much as anybody does. But uh, what we're still trying to do with my book and what we offer that some people don't get because people who've been weaned on the net and on the belief that everything is, a, is there and everything is free and everything should be free, what they don't get is that there's such a thing as curated information. Mm -hmm. And that's... That's what we offer. And uh, so we're not perfect, and we make mistakes, and you may not agree with us, but there is an us. <laughs> yeah. And um, that's the big difference. Uh, it drives me crazy to go on uh, some websites, some prominent websites, to look up just quickly. Uh, screenwriting information or wh whether the film is sourced from a play or a novel or a short story 
not easily found. Yeah. Uh, or or just to get like the name of the who is that who is that woman playing the best friend? Yeah. She must be billed second or third. It shouldn't be hard to find her. Oh no, they're listing the cast in billing order. No, sorry, not in billing order. They're listing the cast in order of appearance on screen. Right. Stated. Or in alphabetical order. Yeah, that's a pain. Yeah. That tells me nothing. <laughs> yeah. If you go to see, if, if you check, a, if, if you go to look up a movie, if you go to look up Prometheus uh, on, on one of these prominent websites. Right. And You're... you can't find Charlize Theron on the front, on the, on, on, on the, the, the main page of the cast list. Something's wrong. Yeah. That's not useful. Now, I noticed you're not naming names as far as prominent websites go, but if it's the prominent website I think you're mentioning, has this particular website posed any kind of... I mean, we're, in the, we're both in the print, and print business in this right. respect. Has it caused much damage to the publication of your book or the audience size? Has it shrunk? Uh, sure it has. Uh, and how, how could it not? Right. Uh, you know... The, the, Enough said. Yeah, enough uh, said. Uh, and uh, uh, I know the challenges I face trying to maintain accuracy and currency uh, with a book that comes out once a year and that lists a finite number of movies. Trying to do that for an infinite number of movies, 24-7, right. is, is, is Herculean, to put it mildly. So, uh, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, throw stones. Uh, indiscriminately. Yeah. My my final question for you, Mr. Moulton, is um, since we're on the Ridley Scott tip, just um, maybe some thoughts on the passing of Tony Scott. Not a good subject for me because uh, I don't want to be a hypocrite. Okay. Uh, I was not a fan of his work. Right. I'm shocked by his death and sad that anybody, you know, would take their life period, take, let alone take it in that way. Right. So, you know, I, I don't want to make light of it in, in, in any, any sense, but uh, I turned down a bunch of interviews yesterday. So okay. I, yeah, All right. But... We'll let that one lie then. Um, listen, I, I got to say, I love this interview, and um, I was going to put this in the print uh, edition of Fangoria, but... Um, I don't know. I'm going to let you have the choice. Do you want me to run this online? I mean, it may actually become viral that we can use the internet to our advantage and it might even point more arrows to uh to sales i mean it's up to you print or or I, I, i'm not going to make that decision i'm going to leave that to you okay thanks you think is is the the most uh, uh effective and uh useful way to reach your, your audience with this is fine with me okay either way whether it's a, a some a scan of the article or a, or an mpeg or, or a file i'll make sure that you get a copy of it that's very kind of you. And thank you for all your flattering words. No, really. Thank you for, for making me the movie lover I am today, sir. Really. I mean that. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to talk to you, Chris. Thank Take you. care. Bye-bye.